how to enhance your visual footprint. Um, so basically kind of what is exactly is your visual footprint? Um, it's kind of just like how you represent your company through photos because obviously everybody kind of knows right now that photos are so important with social media. I mean, as far as like we had Facebook where people had photos and writing and then we had Twitter, which was just writing. And then that was all surpassed so quickly by Instagram, which is really just photos and things like Pinterest, which are photos. So clearly people, when they're looking online and they're looking at things, they want to look at pictures. They don't necessarily want to read a lot of stuff. So actually when I comprise these slides as well, I tried to use as many photos as possible and I can just talk about them because I really, I am a very visual person. I'm terrible at writing. Um, and I, I'm like, I'm crazy about photos. So that's kind of like the way that I wanted to go across this. So I am the owner of Design by Numbers. Uh, my name is Rebecca Zajac and just a little background on my company. So I started in this industry um, back in, oh man, it's been a while now, back in like 2009, I started out as a designer, like an assistant designer and an intern for a couple like large design firms. Um, and then I actually went into uh, television. I worked for some shows on HGTV and worked as an interior designer behind the scenes. So I kind of started in an odd place with, um, interior design and the fact that when you work for television, you don't actually have like a client that you deal with like you interview the client and then you kick them out of their house for a week and you go in and you design the whole house and then they come back in and you don't have any of those interactions with the client being like oh I don't like that why does it not look good when you're like halfway through the project so when I started my own company it was kind of like a, oh my gosh like how do you do this when the clients like literally breathing down your neck um, but we have found through the internet and through our photos which I learned how to do really well when I worked for television that my company has grown probably 600% um, since we started when I went full time with my company about two years ago. And we've exploded simply by using pictures on the internet. I mean, obviously, now that we're doing work and we've been working, you know, for two years, which actually, it's not very long. But, um, but I, I live here in Vegas. And when I was working for television, I was in LA. So um, obviously, I had to build a whole new client base when I moved out here to Las Vegas. So now that we've been out here, it's like I started by getting clients by Instagram, by house, by photos, and my company started getting tons of hits through Pinterest and all these things. And it was like, it was a natural thing for me in the beginning. And I didn't necessarily understand how I was getting so much traffic so quickly and so easily. And then when I started to break it down and talk to other people who are like, you know, hey, like, how, how can I get clients? How can I get this and that? And then they're like, oh, well, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't do photos. I haven't hired a photographer. I don't want to spend the money on that. And that is how you get people. I mean, as a designer, as, as we are all designers, we are going to get clients based off of our work. And if we can't represent our work through photos, you're not, you're going to miss out on a lot of those clients. And now over time, you're going to get, you know, referrals through word of mouth, through happy clients and stuff like that. But it's like, that's only could be like this much. And then there could be this many people that could be finding you based off your photos and then when you get into if you want to get magazine spreads and get covered on blogs and things like that and gain traffic it's you really really need those photos and we've had a lot of success in the beginning with my company um like i said through all social media channels so i'm just going to kind of share some of the things that i've learned as we've gone through how we've been able to build our brand online and how you guys can build yours so, um, so what we're going to be covering today is going to be styling and photographer photography, and we're just going to kind of cover the basics of photography here. We're not going to be going through and um, telling you know like the settings on a camera and this that. We will. I'm going to do a webinar specifically for how to shoot your own work on a budget. I do have a PDF. I'm I'm updating it right now, but I'll email it to everybody who signed up for the webinar on some basic equipment that you can buy this and that that you can do your own photography if you don't want to invest in hiring a professional for all your projects which we actually do all our own photography um, with my company i do all of it just because i have the equipment um, so i'm happy to share that with you guys and um, teach you guys in another webinar actually how to do the photography but we're going to touch base on like how to set up for the photography and things like that um, and that goes right into elevating your portfolio because your portfolio is literally like your digital advertisement of your business. People aren't going to click on my business because they have a cool name 
or I mean, you don't want people clicking on you because you're inexpensive or you're cheap or your budget. You want people clicking on it because they love your beautiful work and they want you to come in and design your home. So um, that is, so like I said, from photography into, um, you know, elevating your portfolio, it just, it goes right into it. And then from there, once you have strong photography of your work, strong styling, all that good stuff, then you go in and you can create a unique digital, creating unique digital content. And that is where you guys are going to get people, you know, following your Instagram and going on Pinterest. And if you have blogs and things like that, if you want to get those hits to your website, Pinterest is number one place for me in particular where I get traffic back to my sites that and being, you know, featured on other, um, social media channels through emails. I've been featured with HGTV through their emails on like this designer, this and that, um, other blogs and things like that. But for the most part that like general constant traffic to my site comes from Pinterest and the way that you get the site, the traffic back to your site from Pinterest is creating that digital content, but you can't do that without good photos. So it's all kind of like this big, thing that you kind of got to start in one place and get to where you are going. Um, so we're going to talk about photography and styling first and photography from, uh, in my opinion, and like people are going to tell you different things all the time. And, but this is for us in particular, and it's been successful for us is it's the single best way to gain an online audience because you know, people are going to go with, they're going to click on your portfolio. If you hand somebody a card, even like a paper, like, business card and your website's on there if they're interested in hiring you they're probably going to jump on your website so you need those good photos of your of your work the good styling all that stuff in order to engage those people to let them know like hey she was really cool and i'm super excited she's an interior designer and oh my gosh her work is great and i want to hire her and we all know that you can easily have a great room that's not styled well that's not photographed well and it's not going to read well and your clients are going to judge that so styling and getting the photography the way that you want it is super super important um and that just goes right into like you could be the best designer but if you have bad photos you're missing out on a ton of clients and like i said that's like the two ways that we usually get clients is referrals and through people seeing your content, which is now all digital, all online. Um, so if you don't have the best representation of your work out there on your website with good photography and all that good stuff, then you're missing out on that second group of clients, which might not know each other from your other group. I mean, referrals are great and I've gotten great clients from referrals, but honestly, some of the biggest clients that I have right now were found me online. Um, through my photos, which is awesome. And then, um, yeah, that's exactly kind of what I said on the third point there. Aside from valuable referrals, a good portfolio is what you need to get good clients. And I think that we all kind of know that, but it's so, sometimes I see, you know, when I'm going through and I'm looking at other designers and I'm getting, you know, who, who else is out there, you know, who's doing what, you know, trying to, you know, see kind of what's trending and things like that. I'll click on someone's, you know, website and they're great for, they're a great designer. I mean, I can tell because I can look past the photo that they're great designer, but their photos, excuse my language, they suck. And not everybody's going to look at it with an edited eye. Just like when you, when you have somebody who's buying a house, we all know staged houses sell better than unstaged. It's the same house, but if you stage it and you invest in that, then we know that someone's going to come in and probably get multiple offers on it because they just can't visualize it. So just like staging a house is going to make the house sell for more staging and styling your work and photographing it properly is going to sell you as a designer for more money for better clients. Um, so the first thing you want to do, uh, whether you're doing your own photography or if you're hiring a photographer is you want to create a shot list. And for anybody who doesn't know what a shot list is, it's literally a list of what shots or pictures you want to take of your space. So this space in particular, this is uh, Ian Brennan's house. It was, I worked on Secrets from a Stylist with Emily Henderson way back in like 2010. This was our pilot episode that we did and um, still one of my favorite rooms that we did on the show. And um, you can see the main room in there. The first shot on this, these little just sequence here is the overview of the room. Then it goes down into kind of like a cropped shot of the bench that's in the window and then down to an even more cropped shot of the, um, you know, the books on the table. And these shots are actually cropped down from the actual shots because they're square so that they would fit in this slide. But I just wanted to kind of give you guys an overview of like 
what you want to do when you create a shot list. So when you do your shot list, you want to go through the room that you've designed or rooms and use your cell phone because we are all walking around with literally a mini computer in our pocket. So you can use your cell phone and shoot some of those shots unstyled, bad lighting, so you know what angles look best. So you know that I want an overview going this way. Maybe I want an overview going this way. This looks really good. And then I really like these like details that I've done. You know, the window's really pretty here. So I want a shot underneath the window. The bench is really pretty because it's vintage. And then like maybe some details. I really like the styling vignette that I'm going to do over here. So I'm going to shoot this. And you literally make a list on a piece of paper that's like each shot that you want of the room. That way, if you have a photographer coming in or if you're doing your own photography, you could make sure that you get those shots, which are going to be the shots represented in your portfolio. And then you can, I mean, you don't have to stick to it to a hundred percent. Make sure you cover those when you're shooting it. But as you're shooting, you might be like, oh wait, this angle looks great. Or the lighting looks great this way. And you can add in there, but at least you know the day that you're shooting, because it can get kind of hectic when you like come in and you're propping and all that stuff, um, that you have a guide with what shots you want of the room. And you always want to start big. So start with the overview of the whole room and shoot down until you get to the little details. Because if you look through somebody's portfolio, there might be a shot of something that's like, wait, I can't see. And, and bloggers are known to do this all the time is they shoot these little vignettes, these little tight crops of things. And you're like, oh, that looks so beautiful. But the rest of the room secretly, it looks like crap. Um, but that's okay because you get that one photo. I mean, it's not okay in the fact that the rest of the room likes crap. I mean, I would hope that if you're designing a room, the room doesn't look like crap and you have one great vignette, but you want to make sure that like you get those little details. It's not just an overview of the room, but it's not just little vignettes. And then let's say you work with a, a client that maybe they ruined part, I mean, excuse my, I mean, we're all designers here. So they went through and they changed your whole design plan. So most of the room you're like, eh, this doesn't really look like what I wanted it to look like. The client's super happy, which is great, but you're like, it doesn't really, like, it's a kind of bummer. Cause it's like, I don't really want to photograph this room cause it doesn't look that great. But there is this one little element, this one little vignette in the room that looks great. Just shoot that, like you use that and put that in, if it's this much of the space that represents your work and the rest is a hot mess because the designer took their own initiative to change everything, still, I mean, you still invested your time in that, get that one shot for yourself, get that in your portfolio. If it's not the whole room, that's okay. Um, but that's just kind of like what you want to do when you're kind of going in and approaching it. Um, then let's talk about propping and I'm using Emily's, uh, work here again from her website because she's kind of really really known to be a stylist and when i worked for her on her show i considered myself a decent designer i was good at space planning and, and scale and all that stuff but where i was missing that key element was in the styling so i was super excited to kind of work underneath her because she started as a prop stylist and learn her tricks from her trade everybody styles differently so emily in particular is is pretty heavy-handed with the styling if you've ever looked at her work and if you haven't looked at her work go to her blog style by emily henderson i'm not getting paid to plug her or anything but she gives really good tips on how to style so if you're if you're questioning like how do i do a kitchen how do i do that how do i do this go onto her site she's a good one to do or anybody who's really well known throughout the online community and look at their work and see what it looks like. So what I've written down below here is that the key elements to that you want to have with you when you go take photos, you want books, trays, boxes, art, and sculptural objects. So a lot of questions that designers get is like, oh, well, I did this whole room, but the client doesn't want to pay for all these styling things. And that's okay. When you go in to shoot the room for your portfolio, if the client's styling objects are bad, then you need to bring in objects yourself and prop with your own. I'd say nine times out of 10, when I bring items in, the client usually ends up buying 80 to 90% of them. So make sure you're bringing in items that the client can buy. You don't want to bring in like grandma's beautiful, you know, jewelry box that you've had since a kid and like style and the client's like, oh my gosh, I love that. I totally want to buy it. And you'd be like, you can't buy that. That's my grandma's. Like you want to make sure like it, everything's an opportunity to sell. And when you style up the space for the client, then you get the opportunity to really kind of sell everything that you've done. So normally what I do before I'm doing a photo shoot is I dedicate an entire day to what we call schlepping. And that's going out and buying products. I always have some degree of 
items and things in my on my shelves. I mean, you can kind of see behind me. My office is a mess, but I have things back there um, that I always have that I find at like flea markets and Goodwill and dumpster diving. I mean, the really cool, interesting items can usually be found at like Goodwills, uh, any type of, you know, flea markets and things like that. If you live near Los Angeles, um, I know that the Rose Bowl is like the biggest flea market, but here's a little secret. Go to the Long Beach flea market because you're going to get better stuff for better prices because it's not Rose Bowl flea market, which is in Pasadena. Um, and that's usually when I take a trip out to LA, I will go and I do probably once every three to four months when I start to get low on like cool vintage stuff to style in there because you don't want everything to be new. You don't want the whole room to string. Hey, I got this all at Target. Like it's not a Target advertisement. You want to make sure that you have degrees of accessories lay layered in from all over. And don't be afraid to use what the clients have. Like if the clients have some great things that you're working through, make a note of it. So when you go to style, be like, Hey, you know, I saw you this great lamp, this and that move it to the room, cheat it. It doesn't have to live in that room at the end. If the client wants that lamp in their bedroom and you want that lamp for the photo shoot, move it for the photo shoot and then move it back. That's fine. Um, and then the other things that I do is like, but aside from the vintage items that I kind of keep on hand, I do shop at your basic big box stores. So a lot of my go-tos would be um, Cost Plus World Market surprisingly has a lot of great stuff. And I actually have um, one vignette in here. I'll show you where I use a lot of their stuff. Um, and then you always have Target. Target is great in the fact that they always are changing their inventory. So you can kind of go in and shop with their current inventory. And then if you wait a couple months, then those items are discontinued and then you have new ones. So that way you don't feel like it's like too much of like a Target advertisement. Like we literally bought everything from Target. And you can always, if you, I know this is kind of weird, but I always say like to get the good stuff from Target, you go to the ghetto Target when it comes time for them to bring in a new um, selection of stuff because ghetto targets tend to have the products there. Whereas like, I remember when I was working in LA and we would go to like the, the target in Hollywood, it never had anything because everybody's styling for TV and, you know, shows and magazines and stuff would go buy everything. But if we went into like the ghetto -y areas, then I could find the items that I was looking for because it just wasn't where everybody else was shopping for necessarily home goods. Um, so here in Vegas, we have a couple like not super popular targets that I'll go when I know items are popular and they're selling out and nine times out of 10, they have them there. Um, so it just kind of depends like when Target comes out with new things, I'll go through some of them I'll buy and I'll keep on hand so that I have for later. And some things like when I'm doing a shoot and I know, hey, I'm doing a kitchen and I need a whole bunch of kitchen stuff, then I'm just going to go, like I said, dedicated day before the photo shoot and just grab everything. And I will spend anywhere between $500 to $2,500 on accessories. But the good thing is, is anything that you're buying new in particular for a shot, I know it doesn't sound great, but it's what we do. It's returnable. So you go in, you style it, keep your tags on it, hide the tags, things like that. Style your shoot, see if the client wants to buy any of it. If the client doesn't buy anything, bring it back. Obviously, if it's gotten damaged or broken, don't bring it back. That you consider that a loss. Um, but the way that I look at it to try to justify the whole returning thing, because it's never great to be like, oh yeah, I just like borrowed it and then styled it and brought it back. Um, is that like, I'm trying to sell these items, items to the clients and then the client, the items are going to be featured on my pictures and on my Instagram and I'm going to tag them. So I'm giving the company where I'm getting the items from a bit of like free advertisement for kind of letting me borrow the items. But like I said, a lot of times clients do buy what you're styling because when the house is all styled up, it looks so great. So, um, so that's kind of how I do it. And I will just get bags and like, I usually will hire either an assistant or sometimes it's a great opportunity for uh, college students that are looking for internships and stuff like that. They love to work along with photo shoots because they kind of get like, oh, it's the photos, it's the end, it's this and that. Um, so for the most part, when you're out and you're kind of grabbing items, think about the room that you're getting them for. Um, so obviously if you're doing a kitchen, you don't want like a bunch of trays and, oh, you can do a tray in a kitchen, but like boxes and art and books, those don't belong in a kitchen. So make sure you're styling for the room that it belongs in. Um, but like you can see here on these three images, I use these three images from Emily's because it's three different vignettes styled on the same little credenza. And you can kind of see like how things are layered. So you have your horizontal plane 
which are going to be your books and things like that. And you use those to kind of stack books. The easiest thing to do with a book is to stack the books like a little pyramid. And then you have kind of what's going vertical. So here we have three vertical things that are leaning against the wall, which are going to be your, your um, picture, your mirror, and then the picture of the lovely lady over there. And sculptural objects are both the flowers and like the lamps sculptural so it's like something that's not necessarily a square or a, blo a block something that adds interest or organic feel to it so in these going across from left to right it's like the blue lamp it's the gray little vase with the billy bulbs and then the flowers always um and the lamps and trays if you ever have find that like when you're styling that you have like all these like bits and piecey things and it doesn't feel cohesive put a tray underneath it because then all of a sudden it's going to group everything together um and then i know what they always say that things look great in groups of three which is true but don't necessarily keep that as like the bible you can break that rule so many times i'm just like if you just start grouping things groups of three groups of three groups of three because that's what you're supposed to do it's going to start looking like this little like random groupings everywhere so use your judgment use your eye we're all designers we know it looks good and if it doesn't look good if you style it take a picture on your cell phone look at it look at it in the picture if it looks weird change it if it's a group of three and it looks better as being a group of two change it like you don't have to follow these rules they're more like guidelines when you go into it um, but if you have the horizontal planes there when you're styling as far as like books or trays is kind of like the to group it something sculptural with height and then if you find that there's holes things where you're like when you're placing the accessories where it's like oh it looks like it needs something then leaning a piece of art or um, or a mirror or something like that will kind of fill up that horizontal space um, so let's kind of go back through uh, the just to kind of go through what we've already gone over through is photography number one thing before you go into a photo shoot is create that shot list it doesn't take long the day you know when you're getting ready and you're finishing your install go through with your cell phone take those pictures make a list of which ones look good and go in with it whether you're shooting it yourself or you're shooting with a photographer so you know what shots that you want to um, get and make sure you're covering the overall oval of oh, i cannot talk this morning over all areas and then work your way down to the smaller vignettes um and blah 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 you just have when we talked about that and then the other thing and i did touch on this when we we're kind of just doing a couple uh answers to questions before we got started is pay attention to what time of day gives you the best light in the room daylight is the best light that you can get um, but obviously like one lady mentioned, I live in the Pacific Northwest. Obviously if it's cloudy all the time, you're not going to get a lot of daylight. So then we can go into like working with fill lights and things like that, um, on the actual photo shoot day, but pay attention to where the sun is in there. Because if there's, if it's a certain room and it faces like where the rising inside with sunrise, I don't, I don't know these things. See, it's like West East. I have such a bad thing of direction, but I do know before I go to shoot it that I've been in the space long enough that the sun is really bright in the morning or it's really bright in the afternoon and I don't want to shoot when it's a really, really harsh light because it's going to create a lot of weird shadows. You just want that soft light. So just kind of pay attention to where the sun is at the house or the you know commercial property that you're shooting. When does it look the best when it's like nice and bright in there, but it's not glaring sunlight through the windows? That's when you want to schedule your photo shoot. And that's actually really, really important because bad lighting can make or break a shoot. And you can see in this photo that I've put here that um, the, the window is completely blown out with the shears. But it's, I mean, you don't have to see the details. I don't want to show you what's behind the window. Actually, what's behind the window in this particular shot is really, really ugly. Um, so I allowed the sun to kind of blow that out in, in, on purpose. Um, so you don't have to always show the detail that are in the windows. You can let that blow out a little bit. Um, it's just kind of like the style of photographer that photography that you're going for. If you notice with real estate photography, when they shoot with the really wide angles, you can tend to see what's through the windows of a house. You don't want your photos to look like that when you're shooting for, um, your portfolio, you want it a little more editorial. So if you do see some, see some detail behind the window, that's fine, but you don't want the people looking and be like, oh, that's an awesome backyard through that window where you're trying to shoot the living room. Um, and then the second most important thing to your photography is your styling. So buy props. If the client doesn't have the props that you want, if they don't have the budget to um, finish those final elements of say you did like a kitchen renovation 
or like a house renovation. That's mostly what my um, my firm's doing right now is we're doing a lot of renovations. So not a lot of furniture buying and things like that. Um, so when we are done with everything, we buy all our own props or we have some of the props that we've had on hand um, from you know buying vintage and random Goodwills and stuff like that. Um, bring your own stuff because if the client stuff isn't good, if they don't want to buy it, you still need those photos because those photos are going to get you another client. So the time that you spent, it's not billable time when you're shopping to style photo shoots. Your photo shoots are for you, um, but they're your investment into your advertisement. So take the time buy. And in, I mean, it's fun. I mean, shooting and styling is fun. It's hectic, but it's fun. So buy the items and bring them in and make sure that, you know, you get everything. And if it's anything the client decides they don't want to, you know, purchase the end of it, then go ahead and just return it. Or if it's something great that you might use again, keep it. And, you know, maybe you're going to reuse, like I have some particular white items, um, white bases and stuff that I've used a couple times. And after I use them about four or five times, I'll usually like at that point really try to sell them to the client. Cause I'm like, this has been in like six shots um, and, and, you know, get new stuff. And then <clears throat> make sure when you're when you're when you're buying your props, you get your basics, trays, books, boxes, art and sculptural objects. And then when you're using your shot list, you can make sure when you go through that um, that you're using your shot list and you can kind of get an idea of like, hey, I need a vignette here. I need a vignette here and make a list of those like props that you know you definitely need to buy. Be organized going into it. So like it does become hectic when you're just grabbing props from all these stores, but you want to make sure you get everything you need because the last thing you want to do is spend $800 on props, get to the room and be like, oh my gosh, why did I not buy any trays? Um, so just make sure you kind of go in organized when you're, when you're buying those items to prop. And like here you can see with the, with the kid's bedroom, use the kid's toys. Like obviously I don't want to bring in like a bunch of adult books and things like that to prop a, um, a nursery. So this is all, this is actually my son's nursery um that i put here but um you can see the only thing i actually bought to style this that i either didn't get as a toy or something like that is that little globe um it's a little vintage globe that i bought it's a um piggy bank i was like oh i need something kind of like cute to go on top of a stack of books and then i bought that little book end that looks like a leather deer um because bookends are like really good when you're leaning books on stuff the rest of the stuff was stuff that he was given as toys that I just used for um, the photo and styled it because obviously with the kids room, kids stuff are colorful and playful and, and that's what it just needs to look like. Um, obviously, when he gets older, it's not going to be like styled all beautiful like that. But for the photos, that's kind of what I did. Um, and then the other thing that um, when we talk about sculptural objects is plants and florals, which I don't have represented here because it's a kid's room. You're not going to have a bunch of plants in a kid's room. But um, plants and florals add life to a room. So I usually will always bring fresh cuts, fresh cut florals. Um, there's a whole, like, if you're a designer, look for the wholesale market in your local area um, as far as, like, florals are concerned because you, like, don't have to necessarily buy them from the grocery store. Although if you are in a rush, the grocery store always has flowers. Um, best places to get them are, like, Trader Joe's um or whole foods market but um the regular grocery store too and keep your florals simple um you don't need to go out and make some like extravagant floral arrangement to get the idea especially if we're not we're not floral designers we might not be very good at that buy one type of flower one type of flower trim the bottoms of them pop them in a vase it's going to look like you're not trying too hard it's going to add that life and it's really really simple that way um there are there are particular plants that i and floral that I try to stick to when I am um, propping, but for the most part, stick to just one type of flower when you're when you're starting with it. I mean, like peonies are just great. I mean, they get really expensive, except for like one week out of the whole year. But like, they're so pretty when they're when they're placed in a room. And the last thing on here is only prop the items that belong in the room. And I think we kind of went over that. Like, don't prop a bunch of books in a kitchen unless they're cookbooks. Then you can. Um, and then the last thing is hire help, especially if you're doing the photos yourself, get an intern, you know, find a student. I mean, I, I pay all my interns minimum, but at least with an intern, um, you are teaching them a little bit about, you know, the, you know, the end they're, they're getting something from it when they're coming in there or bring an assistant or something, because it's a lot, it's a lot of shopping. It's a lot of schlepping. It's a lot of like 
getting your item staged in the corner so that you know what to pull from, styling it and photo shoot it. It's a lot for one person to do. So please, please, please take the time and hire help. You're investing in your business and your in your in your advertisement when you're doing this. Um, so you can see here, this is a bathroom um, that I did. And these are just kind of three images where you see over, you see the bathroom. It's, it's actually a, it's a really, really small bathroom. So this is very hard to shoot. But the overall in this particular frame was the bathtub and then a close-up detail of the shower and then an even more close-up detail of the stool that's styled, but it also shows the tile on the floor. So just kind of you can see as the progression. Um, and sometimes it will feel like when you're doing your shot list that your, your, your photos are repeating, but when you get done to the end and you're editing it, what goes in your portfolio, grab what catches your eye. If it looks like a beautiful shot, that's great. Like, I don't think the stool necessarily represents me as a designer. It's a stool that I bought and put some stuff on it. But a, this image has been pinned a lot. So obviously, there's something about this image that people really like. So I mean, it's getting me traffic back to the site. They want to see what the rest of the bathroom looks like. So don't disregard when you're getting those like up close shots. Um, and then here you can see this photo is always a struggle for me because this room in particular the cabinets photographed so blue i shot this i was very rushed i didn't white balance i didn't use a reflector so you see a horrible reflection in the um in the refrigerator but this is just me being judgmental over this image this image is a really good example of how good photography or in this case what i consider okay photography but you know decent styling can get you published because this image, HGTV saw it, they wanted to put it in this little thing called Fresh Faces for Design or something like that. Um, and they featured it on their website and then somebody followed my Instagram, saw it, loved it, and then I got a uh, message on Instagram that they wanna publish it in HGTV Magazine. Um, so that just shows how, even though I didn't take the time I needed to to shoot this um, and get and do the color correction on it, it still kind of represented my work well enough where I would share it in the portfolio, but I'm like constantly telling people, no, the cabinets are not blue, they are gray. Um, but how I ended up getting into the magazine. And then you can see here to compare the styling on both of them, actually the magazine copied a lot of the styling that um, I did here with the lemons. You can see they used the lemons, they actually used the same thing, but then they're gonna, a magazine's gonna add a layer in of like, more uh, lived in. So they actually have something that looks like, you know, tea there. And then I remember the notes from the magazine on the styling is they wanted to make sure the florals, you couldn't see the stems in there. That vase in particular is from, um, is from Target. They used my cutting board and then the magazine theme for color was the um, pink and pink and yellow. So you can see that the yellow um, Dutch oven is on the stove and then the pink kind of rug in the corner. But for the most part, the styling's relatively similar. Their placement's a little bit better than mine. Obviously she's a professional stylist and I style my work on the side. And then when I look at it, I'm like, oh yeah, I really like what she did. Um, and again, their images is just, oops, is just a, a lot darker than mine. Um, I just like to blow out my images a little bit more, but you can see we've used reflectors so that the refrigerator looks clean and all of that stuff. So that's just a really good way to show like, how your own photography or if you hire a professional can end up getting you published in a magazine. So on from that, these are not, these. some of these are outtakes, actually that bottom left one because the horizontals aren't perfect is an outtake, but it shows the styling for this kitchen. Um, so this kitchen is another one that uh, I think hgtv.com might be sharing at some point because it kind of looks like Joanna Gaines fixer upper style. This was done um, when I was pregnant and actually the, entire project moved over after I had my baby early. So it was still in demo and it was, a, it was a big mess. So there were some things that I wasn't like thrilled about that I found out later, like the client adding those posts into the island. Um, yeah, we won't go into that. That happened when I was in labor. But for the most part, let's talk about the styling of this room. So it's the the room was really, really gray. The, the walls were gray. The client wanted gray. I was trying to talk them out of gray walls, gray walls, gray cabinets. There's a gray undertone to the floors. So we needed to bring in a lot of warm woods to balance this room. And for me, because we were kind of going for that farmhouse look, a lot of um, just a lot of kind of like the farmhouse thing. So that shelf, that style that I actually shiled those two floating shelves down in the lower left, um, 
almost all of those objects are from cost plus world market um I, this was probably the first photo shoot i did after coming back from what really wasn't a maternity leave um and so i just i didn't have time to go through myself i was just gonna go i think the only thing in here that's mine that i kept is that white vase on the lower left that's like kind of like round and the rest of it maybe a couple things are from pottery barn but for the most part that's all from cost plus world market the florals in this other than the tulips on the counter i went and bought those but the billy balls are which are kind of over by the round cutting board um were her wedding bouquet and then the branch that you see on the island i actually just clipped from a tree in the backyard so you can use things that you find especially like when you find like oh it needs more life it just doesn't look like alive enough then you know go in the backyard and clip some bushes because you can get florals that way if you don't have the right ones this one in particular i needed something with height um and then you can just see how i've kind of grouped and layered everything over on the shelves um, as i went through and i just kind of go through and stack them stand back look at it go back in style it and then go back and forth but i knew going into this i needed to fill those shelves up because the client had nothing and I didn't want it to feel too, I mean, it's it's very busy. It's very styled. Um, but I also didn't want it to feel too busy. So I stuck with a very clean color palette. I went with woods, whites, and a little bit of kind of that blue, like natural looking glass that you kind of see in those cups down below. And there's a little mint green on some of those like tops, but those aren't really like accent colors. They just happen to be there. Um, so that's just another one that I kind of went through. I wish I had a before we styled it, which I didn't take um, of the kitchen, but um, just kind of a way to take something that wasn't necessarily an ideal looking room. And then I kind of blew out the walls to make them look a little less gray because it was very gray on gray on gray, gray on gray. Um, but the overall photo turned out pretty nice. Actually, the stools are from Target um, and I put those together and actually that took a long time and then disassembled them and returned them because the ones the clients bought, I didn't love them, but I wanted to get this project in my portfolio. Um, so this is me postpartum, like two months styling this, quite delusional, quite frantic, but the photo still came out decent. Um, so, and then that's going to go into um, your portfolio. So basically you want to think of your portfolio as your digital advertisement. Um, and like I said before, not every project you do needs to be in your portfolio. If you do a project and you don't love the outcome or you took a client because you needed money, but it's not necessarily work that you want to be known for say it's somebody who i mean dare i say tuscan like that really dark tuscan look you don't love tuscan you don't like doing it but it was a good client it was you needed the money get it it happens like there are sometimes when you just need to take a client to take a client um don't put that in your portfolio because if you do that and you take pictures of it in your portfolio somebody who loves tuscan is going to see that picture and hire you for Tuscan design. So if that's not what you're going for, like don't not take a client because it's not portfolio worthy work, but just don't shoot it and put it in your portfolio unless you want it to represent your brand. Um, and that just goes right into like, make sure the projects that you showcase represent you as a designer. This uh, kitchen, I do have it in my portfolio. It's a vintage revival kitchen from the fifties where we didn't change anything, but it, yeah, it's completely different than the farmhouse kitchen, but for me, it still represents what I do um, as a designer. So I'm fine with this being in here. And actually, I got a really cool client that wanted to do this like retro um, bar in their mid-century house. Um, so I did get an awesome client from doing this kitchen. Um, and actually, this kitchen got a lot of traffic on apartment therapy. Apparently, vintage kitchens are a thing, although some people think that the walls look peach and they're yellow so i've never gone in to color correct that um they look yellow on my monitor but maybe they look peach on other people's i'm not sure so i really should go back in and color correct the photo but i haven't done that um and then another thing about your portfolio it's better to have a few really good projects than a ton of mediocre projects so as you get more photos as you get more work that more represents you take out the ones that are not that great don't feel that you need 18 different projects representing you in your portfolio you know 
bring it down. It's okay if you only have one or two, because if they're one or two and they represent you and they're photographed well, those are going to bring you the clients that you want, as opposed to like, if you have 16 projects and they're all kind of okay, I might go through and look at two or three of them and just be like, oh, she's an okay designer. And then maybe I want to get a second opinion. So don't be afraid to only have you don't need a huge portfolio. And then as you, you know, as you get better photos and better clients, you're going to get a better portfolio. Um, and then the last thing that I kind of mentioned before is don't be afraid to just shoot a vignette that you love in a room that overall the room wouldn't necessarily make your, make your portfolio. So in this kitchen in particular, like maybe I just wanted to shoot that vintage stove that we had refurbished and the rest, of, maybe like the rest of the kitchen wasn't that great. So I could just take a shot of that stove cropped in that shows the vintage stove redone with some styling on the top and it would have looked really pretty but maybe the rest of the room wasn't a good representation so I just wouldn't have shot the rest you still get an image for your portfolio and that kind of goes into hows and I've seen um, some ladies kind of ask is it worth paying to advertise on house on the Ivy um, Facebook page and I do use house and I did advertise on house. I no longer have to advertise because organically I come in at the very top almost for Las Vegas. Um, but when I started out, I did start out advertising on house. But the one thing about if you're going to advertise on house is house is strictly photos. So if you don't have a good portfolio, if you don't have those really good shot, those really good, you know, money shots of your work to sell your work, don't pay to advertise on house. It's like paying an advertisement company when you don't have any product photos. Um, but is it worth to pay to advertise on house if you have a really good portfolio? Yes, because I will say I've gotten some very big clients and within one client, you're gonna pay for the entire investment on house. I don't work in as saturated as a market as say like LA or like Portland or, I mean, sorry, I only know like the West Coast areas, East Coast people, but, um, so for me, it was a little bit easier to get on house. But honestly, the, the things that did well for me on house are the same things that did well for me on Pinterest is my content was unique. It was eye-catching, apparently, with photos. And so I started to gain traffic. And then house ended, actually ended up featuring a ton of my work on their like email blasts and you know their newsletters and things like that. So when house is grabbing your images and sharing them with their millions, I don't even know how, what their um, user rate is at this point. Um, that in itself brings tons of people back to your, um, to what house would be your online portfolio is pretty much what it is for your business. So I do think it is worth paying to advertise on house. If you do find that you have to, that you need more clients, you're not getting enough otherwise, but you do want to make sure that you have that work that's eye catching that sets you apart. You have, I mean, you have to think about, you know, what these people aren't meeting you. They don't get to, you know, see how awesome you are as a person. They're judging you literally by your work. So if your work doesn't look great, don't pay to, you know, to advertise it. And then we'll also kind of touch base on the uh, your website and the saying, "Don't judge a book by its cover." This does not apply. <laughs> doesn't apply to the website. It doesn't apply to your online portfolio. It does not apply when you're trying to sell your brand online, especially a brand in particular. You're selling your design, your ideas. Um, if your website doesn't look good, people aren't going to hire you. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to, like somebody's given me a card and I've checked out the website and I'm like, ah, and I, and your website sucks, so I'm not even interested. You can have the coolest business. I'm really judgmental about websites. If I think the website looks cheap, then I probably am less inclined to like look further into your company. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to pay a ton of money to get a good website. There are templates out there. And so if you're going to use a template to feature some of your work, and maybe it's somebody that only has like three or four photos, put those three and four photos on there and then put some information about your company. You have something so that when you give your card out, people can go online and remember you by. But the biggest thing is if you're going to use templates and you, you're you going to use it yourself is keep it simple. Let your portfolio and the images of your work be the star, not a fancy website template. You don't need animations and me, please don't put music in the background. Like that's really distracting. Just keep a really simple, I mean, if you're going to do a template, um, use a template that's like for a photographer because a photographer, they're selling their photography and pretty much online you're selling the photography of your work. So something really simple, features nice, big, beautiful images, nice and clickable, there's a good, like, you know, maybe about you page, and then like, what kind of design are you doing? Um, 
I'm a huge advocate of not putting pricing online. Every pro project is different as far as pricing goes, but if you're offering an e-design service, that's something that you can do pricing online if you want to catch those people. But you know, just know that if you're ad putting pricing online on your website, you're going to attract people who are price comparisons. They're not necessarily hiring you 100% off your work, but they might be pricing you out compared to other companies offering the same thing. And I don't know if those are necessarily the clients that you want to be going after. You want a client that wants to hire you because your work is beautiful. So make your look, your work look beautiful online. Um, so here, this is kind of what it's going to look like. I'm going to give you guys a little clip of um, my, the background, the back end of my house. And you can see I have promoted, I think my paid promotion, I'm still paying to promote. I think it ends in November. Um, I've been on there since 2014. I didn't start paying for it right away. I, I think I've been paying, I paid for two years um, of promotion. But like I said, this next year, I don't need to pay for it because organically I hit the top. But you can see on here just how many people are looking at my photos on house, which is a very, very saturated, you know, site of, um, of pictures. There's so many pictures on here. But in the last 30 days, I've had 56,000 impressions on house. 41 of the, or 71 of those are organic. The pro promoted ones are probably people local in my area that might be looking at things. But um, I'm not doing anything on house other than I took the time, you know, a while ago to put some really good projects on here. I'm, I'm not constantly acting on this to keep the traffic up. It just does itself. So then you can kind of see, like, in the last 90 days, the 90 day and the 30 day are pretty consistent with each other. And then the 360, I mean, I've been pretty consistently featured on their little newsletters once they started using my work. Um, so I just, I get a good amount of traffic. You get random questions from people. I've actually gotten clients that don't live in this state from here. House is a really, really good thing, but you need those photos. I just realized that you can see my dog in that photo. That's a really old photo, um, the little banner photo at the top. But that's my dog, Lexi, in the corner. Um, and that is an old picture of me. I should probably update it. That's like back in the days of like Becky with the good hair. Um, but I think that picture is like six years old. That's like pre-baby, pre-baby gain weight, all that good stuff. But for the most part, um, so I'm lying a little bit on my picture to my clients, but at least my work speaks for itself and I'm getting the traffic from it. And so for me, two years of investment into house, which each I have gotten, I mean, one of my biggest clients I got from house, which believe it or not is an 8,000 square foot custom build that we're building right now that we'll be building for the next 20 years at the rate that it's going. Um, she hired me off house. I mean, normally those big clients are going to get through referrals, but she found me on house. She hired me from house. And then I've been working with the architect who I've partnered with now. So now I have an 8,000 square foot house, 11,000 square foot house, 14,000 square foot house, and we have another 12,000 square foot house coming up that I partner with this architect. So technically, all of those huge projects came from house because one person hired me on house. So is it worth it? Yes. Get the photos, get your photos, then pay to advertise. Um, and then we're going to kind of go into Pinterest, which for me has been really successful um, as far as just gaining. If you have a blog, if you're trying to get hits to your website, you just want to get your traffic up. Um, Pinterest is going to be the number one place for you to get hits back to your blog. I know Instagram is offering things now where you can put stuff and then like click on it and it links over. It's a newer thing. But for me, Pinterest has just been really awesome. So what I did here is I grabbed three really popular trending images right now off of, um, uh, ha off of, I'm sorry, off of Pinterest. And you can see one of them is actually from Instagram. You can pin Instagrams now. I can't say I've been working actively with Pinterest lately because I've been so busy that I'm not like constantly promoting myself on there currently. But, um, Apparently, you can pin off of Instagram. I need to, if you don't keep up with this stuff, it's constantly changing. And then it, this, I don't have a social media manager with my company. Maybe eventually I can afford to hire one um, to manage this stuff because it can get overwhelming. And that's why I'm just touching on the ones that for me have been successful. Um, so the one thing that I want you guys to look at here is that when you share your content, and you want to make sure it's a unique digital content, you want to make sure if you're sharing stuff to get hits back to your website, it's your work. Um, I mean, obviously, you can share somebody else's work and tag them back. People are usually fine with that. But this, but they, then people on Pinterest has probably seen it before. So um, these images here, 
like I said, were some of the, the popular ones related to interior design and things that do well on Pinterest um, is the timing that you pin it and you can find those grabs on the line. If you just look at like, like Pinterest, when's the best time to pin? Just Google it. Um, Cause I didn't want to bore you with a bunch of numbers, but visually, what does well on Pinterest is vertical photos because if you look at your Pinterest feed, you're going to notice that like when you scroll up, the vertical photos get a bigger footprint on the page than the horizontal photos, just the way that it's formatted. So you're going to find that if you have two different photos from a project that you did and one is horizontal and one is vertical, the vertical one just by nature of it being vertical is going to do better and get more pins on Pinterest. Um, which is actually kind of challenging for a designer because a lot of our shots are horizontal because we're shooting these like horizontal planes. But just remember that when you create your shot list, if you're doing something to get content to go back on Pinterest, you want to make sure in your shot list that you have those vertical photos. Like this, these are the photos in my shot list that are going to, you know, do well for me on Pinterest. The other things that do well on Pinterest that are very well represented in these three particular images are images that contain a lot of white. Um, your eye naturally just gravitates towards white. Um, so when you're in this stream of photos, the photos with this white, it's almost like the negative space in the photos. Um, they're going to catch your eye more. So this, the photo with the stairs, you have all the white in the background, the photo with the table, the, you know, the, the window is that window in particular is pretty blown out, but you can see a little bit of detail, but I'm not looking through the window at what's in the detail on the window. I'm looking at the vignette on the, on the table. And then the image on the right as well, the walls are white, the countertops are white. White images or images with a lot of white do really well. And that's why I tend to photograph and kind of blow out my photos a little bit to make them really bright because online those do better. Um, the last thing that does really well on Pinterest that doesn't really, isn't really represented well in these photos and I don't necessarily use it 100%, is the use of red, which you'll notice with um, all advertising is like when somebody's advertising something and they have like a button or a click here or a buy now, it's usually in some kind of color of red. Um, there's not a lot of red in these images. There is red flowers in the image with the stairs and there's a little bit of like a reddish flower of the image on there. So these aren't necessarily great representations of that. Red in particular in interior design is a difficult color because your eye gravitates towards it so strongly. Um, but if you're trying to do something to get clicks back, maybe you've done a DIY or something to like get clicks to your blog, think about the fact that if you add a lot of white, get vertical images, add some degree of red or, you know, whether it's in your text or if it's in the florals, maybe you bring in kind of like a bright pink or something like that. Um, those things are going to catch your eyes more on Pinterest than if you just were to just create content blindly and then hope that people repin it. Um, these are images that we've done um, on Pinterest. I'm not promoting them currently, but they have gone crazy viral for us on Pinterest. In particular, these hand-drawn images that we did back in our days when we did renderings by hand. Um, the one on the left has done is my number one pinned thing it's actually longer than that there's three so you can see how long that is because there's actually one more image of what size rug and we were doing that just to get people back so we knew if we offered tips if you offer a little like you can read it really easily that one in particular notice it's not red but it's pink you know it's in a lot of white negative space and it's a very long image that image went crazy i think off of one pin alone over two hundred and ten thousand pins off of one pin and you know when you pin on Pinterest it goes out and then it goes out and then it goes out like a spider web. So um, you can and, and the other thing is is you can check your sources, um, check your source off your website to see what's being pinned and there's also analytics built into Pinterest now. It wasn't at the time that we set these up but it is now. Um, if you want to check your source on Pinterest you just go to pinterest.com forward slash source forward slash your website dot com. Um, I, and like I said, if I need to put any of this into like a PDF, you know, cheat sheet for you guys later, I can, but like that way you can see what is really popular for you on Pinterest. So image on the left with the sofa is obviously tips or a little bit of text um, that's easy to read. will get a lot of, a lot of clicks, a lot of repins. Um, and then same sort of concept here. We had a couple, we had like four or five of these like tips, which still 
like I said, I'm not actively trying to use them to get traffic back for the site. But I mean, there were days when I was getting like seven, 8,000 hits to my site strictly from Pinterest from these like per day, which is pretty crazy. And the fact that I am not a blogger, I don't constantly update my blog on my website. So I mean, clearly I was doing something right. Maybe I should have followed through with it more. At the time I didn't, I was too busy. Um, but that did well. And then when I did this nursery for my baby, I did another one because um, when I had him, I was kind of stuck at home. I wouldn't say I was stuck at home because I literally didn't take any time off. But um, again, another vertical one where I just wanted the images. I had a lot of horizontal images from the nursery, but I just really wanted to share it because I thought it came out uh, really cute. And so I did two horizontal images stacked to make it vertical, put something on the top. I mean, this particular paint treatment is like crazy popular now. Um, not to say that I was the first to do it. Probably somebody did it before me. Um, but it's, I mean, now it's like wallpaper. It's like, it's, it's the thing and Pinterest has blown it up. Um, so I just kind of wanted to put my name out there. I was like, Hey, I did it too. And actually this image again, caught HGTV's, HGTV's eye. They put it in their little design competition and I won, um, for best, like editor's pick or something like that for the image. And then I got invited to go see the HGTV smart home in Scottsdale, which was actually really cool. So those things happened strictly because of my, you know, images that I'm putting out online. Um, and here you can see, I've done a snapshot of when I kind of exploded onto Pinterest and I haven't maintained this because I haven't needed to use it. Um, but you can see average monthly viewers is 1.7 million um at the time when we were kind of blowing up which was between october of 2014 and march of 2015 i think now pretty consistently i i hang out between 2 million and 3 million but we went up to almost 4 million there um and you can see how fast that trend is rising up and that was really because we were creating that digital content that unique digital content on pinterest and we were putting it out there and it was blowing up um a lot more people are formatting things like that because it's not a secret how we do it to catch people's eyes. But if you have good content, good pictures, and you format it correctly and you put it out on Pinterest at the right time, it's going to get clicks. There's just that many people using the website. Um, so that is pretty much it. Um, and if you guys want to follow me, I put my Instagram, my Facebook for my business is Design by Numbers Studio because somebody has Design by Numbers and I couldn't have it. Pinterest, I'm designed by numbers. Instagram, I'm Rebecca Zajac. And then you can also follow my regular Facebook as well, which is just Rebecca Zajac. I think I'm like the only one out there. Um, so I've got this other computer. And let's see. I guess, um, oop, let me go down to, uh, I'll put this slide, go to the next slide. And, um, I kind of want to like go through and answer everybody's questions because like I said, this is the first time that I've done this and um, I want to see if you guys have any questions on anything. Um, and yeah, so anyways, and like I said, I'm using two computers. So I'm looking at the questions over here and it looks like I only have one. So for right now, I'm going to um, answer this question. Um, okay. How do I answer? What is my answer thing? It's not it's saying comment. I can comment on it. Can I? Oh, I have to answer it on this one. Because I, um, oh, then you can see my face, huh? Oh, wait, did I freeze? Oh, wait, there we go. Okay. Um, here we go. So I'm going to answer this question here. What are the best angles, slightly above, slightly below, dead on? Um, do they differ off of different types of shot, room vignette, et cetera? Uh, yes. Um, so the best angles really kind of depend on what you're shooting. And um, we'll touch more on this when we cover photography in particular. But you want to think of, um, you want to keep your horizontals horizontal and your verticals and vertical as much as you can. So for the most part, when you're shooting, you kind of want to shoot like, uh, I would say it's around four and a half feet off the ground. When you're shooting your overalls, um, not overalls that you're wearing, like your overall images of the room. Um, but then as you kind of come into vignettes and stuff, some vignettes can be shot above directly, but you, you want to think of it as not necessarily eye level standing up, but almost like a belly shot um, for your overalls. And 
don't be afraid to test it. Like you don't want to take an overall, like with your camera way up here, looking down at the room, um, like an aerial shot. That's a little weird. And when you're, when you're having questions about it, if you're in doubt, you know, reference a magazine, reference a blogger who's really good at photos and stuff and see like in a room that's similar to yours, what were the angles that they did? But for the most part, like kind of like that belly shot, that four and a half feet is like the sweet spot for a lot of your stuff. Um, okay. Tara from Ivy. How and when do you arrange? Oh, how do I arrange for uh, photo shoots with clients? So this is kind of like a biggie one that I guess I didn't really touch on. Um, I put in my, um, in my contract that I'm allowed to shoot the room um, when it's all said and done. That way they sign off on it and later down the road they're like, no, you can't shoot the room and this and that. It's in my contract. So that way the client knows I'm allowed to shoot it. Obviously if they have an issue with it, they have to bring it up before we sign contract because obviously I, anything that I work on, I want as content to advertise my business later and get more clients. Um, so then once everything's all done, then I normally will let the clients know like, hey, we're gonna come in, I'm gonna let them buy as much styling things from me as possible before a photo shoot. But if they're like, you know, hey, we're good, this and that, then when the, the project's pretty much done, I will let them know, hey, we wanna come through and do a photo shoot. It's usually for like one room, I'd say a couple hours. Um, sometimes we'll do multiple rooms, so it's gonna be a couple more hours. And I'm like, you know, you guys don't have to be here, you're welcome to be here. Um, and I just need a spot to stage all of my props and things like that. And I just kind of need to let the client like not breathe down my neck. So that's why I also bring help to kind of keep the, keep the client entertained while we go in and style everything. Um, and we always make sure that we put everything back the way it was before we leave. Um, so we arrange that with the client at the end and then we go in and we shoot it. And, um, the way that I keep it straightforward is, you know, just putting it in the contract. Um, and then it doesn't look like there's any more questions. And I talked for a long time. I was like, oh man, maybe this is gonna be like half an hour. Um, so anything else from me, let me know. And like I said, anybody who signed up for this, I will put together a PDF of like budget friendly things to buy if you wanna do your own photography. And um, if there's any questions as far as like how to check your sources and stuff on, um, on Pinterest, let me know and I'll make sure you guys know how to like check that to see what you're getting traffic on and stuff like that. Um, anything else? Yay! Okay, so um, that was awesome. I hope I didn't talk too fast or too long. And um, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Have a good day. Bye!